Okay. Um, so what we're going to talk about now are institutional review boards, uh, which are the same as what you call CEP, CEPs, right, uh, here in Brazil. Um, and this is the same warning that Christine Grady gave you. So for this talk, since it's about ethics, I want you to understand they're just my views. They're not the official views of the U.S. government because this is a field I do work in. I'm not a statistician, but I am an ethicist. Um, I'm going to try to give you an example. So the first half of this talk is going to be a specific case study. And what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to end up describing what the rules are for how IRBs, hopefully similar to how CEPs work in Brazil. But I don't want you to just kind of know that here are a bunch of rules. I want you to understand why they're here. And hopefully it's going to sort of reinforce some of the general principles Christine Grady talked about a couple days ago, but I'm going to give it to you in a particular take in terms of looking at the relationship in terms of particularly those of you who are clinicians, thinking about the relationship between clinicians and patients and how that's different from the research relationship. And if you understand that difference, it could actually tell you a lot about why we have the rules. And in particular, it could tell you why there's so much importance we put on getting informed consent. And I'll show you how it could actually help you answer some rather controversial questions about why we're not doing as good a job in informed consent as we should be in a fair number of clinical trials and how we could do a better job. So that's sort of the game plan. Um, we may be trying to pick up some time to save time for other topics. So I may go through parts of this a little quickly, but raise your hand or something if I'm going through something too quickly. Um, okay, so the example I'm going to talk about, I like to talk about eyes. So I'm going to talk about an issue relating to corneal transplants. And so let me give you a little background. Um, I mean, it's not all that complicated. So you're going to see a few pictures of eyeballs. And the key thing is our cornea, which is the clear part on the outside of the eye. Um, it's really important. It protects our eyeball. Uh, a lot of people don't know inside the eyeball you have the lens, but the cornea actually is more powerful in terms of bending light than the lens is. The difference is that the lens changes shape. It kind of can, can get fatter or thinner, and the cornea can't, but the cornea actually does more of the bending of the light. So it's very, very important. And of course, it's very important that it be clear and that you could kind of uh, the light could go through it, okay? Notice on the outside of the cornea, there's oxygen, there's air, you know, oxygen, nitrogen, whatever. And on the inside, there's fluid, okay? So that's really important. On the inside, it's next to this sea of kind of, you know, watery sort of stuff. And on the outside, it's next to oxygen. Now let me, okay, so this is a pathological specimen. Of course, it's gigantic, but it's just a, a cross section of your cornea. On the top, that's outside the eyeball. On the bottom is inside the eyeball. Um, a middle part, which is sort of, you know, some sort of connective tissue. Um, notice on the outside, there are several layers of cells there. On the inside, the important thing is this is one layer of cells. And you can see the nuclei. You see the little brown, black dots there. It's just one cell layer thick. Um, and let's see, we have, okay. So not as pretty as the other picture, but this is sort of labeling, at least in English, what's going on here. So right, there's the epithelium, the outside, there's the endothelium inside, okay. So why am I explaining all this to you? It's really important that your corneas stay nice and clear and wonderful if you wanna be able to see. And for the cornea to stay clear, it needs exactly the right amount of fluid inside it too much fluid and it's kind of cloudy, too little fluid and it'll kind of dry out. So either way, it's not going to be good. Well, how do we get the right amount of fluid? Um, the key thing is that, no, let me go back one. So, okay. The key thing is that layer of endothelial cells. It's only one cell layer thick, but all of those cells are actually pretty far, powerful pumps. So what happens, remember underneath that cell layer it is fluid. The fluid basically diffuses into the cornea, so it gets lots of fluid in it, and if you just left it to diffusion, there'd be too much fluid into it, and it would be all waterlogged and what we call edematous, and you wouldn't see well. So those, that one layer of endothelial cells 
has powerful pumps and they're continually pumping water out from the cornea back into that fluid filled layer, okay? And if they do their job correctly, you're gonna have exactly the right amount of fluid in the cornea, it will be transparent and you could see well because light will come through, it will get focused, it will get focused in the back of your eye, everything's wonderful. So now let me tell you some problems, okay? It's only one cell layer thick. That's a lot of work those cells have to do with all this pumping, okay? And as people get older, things may damage some of those cells during your lifetime. And remember, because they're one cell layer thick, one other thing is those cells do not reproduce. So it's basically like tiles covering a floor. And in fact, there's a good picture of it. Imagine you were really, really little inside that fluid-filled chamber looking out, this would be what you'd see. Those, that's the one cell layer thick. They're hexagonal, six-sided cells, very beautiful. You're born with them and they look very neat and very beautiful. Over time, some of them are gonna die. Things could happen. As they die, remember, they don't divide. They won't reproduce. So they then have to, the neighbors get thin out and they cover in the rest of it, sort of like retiling the floor. And you could kind of see that. You'll notice that some of the cells there are kind of fat and not exactly six-sided because maybe some cells near them died and they then spread out to fill in the gaps, okay? Well, if enough cells die, eventually you're going to reach the point, remember they're really hard-working cells, but if there's only a number of them left and too many of them died, they're not going to be able to do a good enough job about getting rid of all that extra water in the cornea. Your cornea will get what we call edematous, it has too much water in it, and you're not going to see well. And, and we've known this for a long, long time. So what I'm going to talk about is a way to deal with this problem. And it's, we do it a lot. There's you know, thousands and thousands of people around the world get this surgery every year. And what we're gonna talk about is a corneal transplant. And it's really pretty simple to describe. You basically find some dead person and cut out their cornea. And then you put the cornea in this little dish here. We, we call it a tree find, which is a fancy name for a thing to cut it. And so you put the cornea in the little dish part that's the dead person's cornea. And then you put this on top and you push it down. And that's the little, like I guess you have thimbles when people sew and that kind of thing. It just has a sharp edge there and it will cut out a little corneal button. And then the harder part is you have the person, um, the living person on an operating room table and you make a similar hole in their eye. That's the harder thing to do. And then you take what we call the little button like a shirt button, that's what it looks like, and you put that piece of cornea from the dead person in the hole and you sew it in. That's a corneal transplant. That's pretty much all there is to it. You know, it's not that easy to do, but it's pretty easy to describe, and it just so happens our eyes will let you do that. We'll let you take some other person's cornea and sew it in, and it actually has great results. And just to show you, okay, so that's what an edematous cornea looks like. You can imagine that person will not be seeing very well because not much light will get through that eye and will not get to the back, or it certainly won't get back clearly. And that's a person after the transplant. And actually, that doesn't show it as well as it should. That would be a beautiful cornea. So what I want to talk about a little bit is how you do the transplant, and in particular, how you sew in place that little piece of cornea. Because what you're going to do not a very fancy thing. You're going to actually sew in the, new, the dead person's cornea into the hole in the living person's eye. And you do two types of sutures often. These are called radial interrupted sutures. You can see there are about 16 of them. Okay, And you do them. It takes a little while to do that. And in a moment, I'm going to show you another kind of suture. And just assume in most of these procedures, you try to use both types of sutures because I'll explain why you want to use both. Okay. Why am I describing all this? Because what I'm wanting to describe is something we'll call standard care. And this is a big issue, certainly, in the legal area in terms of relationships between doctors and patients. When you go to a doctor, you sort of expected for the doctor to use all their excellent training and to give you standard care. The notion of standard care is this is the best way to treat this condition, and doctors as a profession have decided this is good, okay? Some areas, there may be more than one version of standard of care, but what I'm talking about here is at least one version of standard care, and for corneal transplants, this is pretty much, let's just assume, the standard way to, to, to do the transplant. 
Okay, so remember I told you there are two types of sutures, two types of ways to sew the thing in, and you use both. Let's assume you're using both. Before I showed you the picture of the interrupted sutures, and now I'm showing you the other suture, um, which you see this, and you see the little kind of dark spot there. This is one long suture. And what the surgeon has to do is you start where the ball is and you go from the side of the patient and then you go to the side of the donor cornea and you keep going back and forth. It's just like sewing, okay? But the suture is very, very thin. You wouldn't be able to see this without an operating microscope. And so it takes you a few minutes to do this and you got to do it really carefully because since it's so thin, if you pull too hard at one point, you may break the suture and then you're gonna have to start all over again. So you try to do it very carefully and somewhat slowly and go all the way around. And the little dark thing is just the knot. You actually tie the two ends together when you get to that point. Okay, I mean, pretty straightforward. It's not rocket science or anything. You just have to be really careful. So remember, I'm telling you, you're trying to be really careful when you do this. You're trying to be uniform in terms of the amount of pressure. Well, at some points, you're a person. You're not perfect. You're not a robot. You may be a little tighter at some places than at other places. You may have heard of something called astigmatism. A lot of us actually have it. If you look in different axes, your eye actually has different refractive power. Remember, the cornea is actually more powerful than the lens in terms of focusing light. So if if this suture is tighter in some places than other places, you're gonna create some kind of astigmatism. Not a good thing. So what happens is, as the eye heals, you do this procedure, you're not gonna see all that well, probably for at least a few weeks and maybe a few months. You, you test the curvature of the cornea with a lot of machines, and over time, you may cut. Remember, you had the 16 interrupted sutures? Well, if in some parts of the eye it's too tight, you then cut after a few weeks or a month. You cut some of those interrupted sutures to relax that part so it's not so tight. So that's sort of how you adjust the curvature of the eye after the procedure, and hopefully, eventually, it will get actually pretty good. And even if it's not perfect, there are other things you could do. You could use contact lenses or glasses afterwards, but ideally you don't want to do that. So still all that is part of standard care. But you could probably recognize that's not perfect, okay? If you're familiar with cataract surgery, for example, very common these days, you go for the surgery, two hours later you come out, you seem perfectly okay. A corneal transplant, you're not going to see perfectly okay two hours later. It may take a month, two months, three months, okay? And plus, you might say, well, you're going to have to be in the operating room for a half an hour. You know, that's somewhat expensive, et cetera. It prevents some people from getting a surgery. So although we have standard care, we might want to improve it. And what I'm going to tell you about is the story of one doctor, a very smart doctor, who came up with a method to improve it and some problems he encountered. And again, I'm not going to, you'll see, I'm going to say some bad things about what he did, but my goal is actually not to criticize him and to use this as an example to get us to think about a way about thinking about research versus standard care. Okay, so this is Dr. James Rousey, and he had an idea of improving this system, okay? And in fact, uh, remember I told you about the tree find, the, the device for cutting out the little corneal button? He came up with a new tree find. And he was from Tampa. It's a city in Florida in the U.S. And if, if you ever invent anything, you need to give it a good name. So he called it the Tampa Tree Fine, which in English it sounds pretty good. So, okay, so there he was very happy. He wasn't always happy after this. That's the only picture I actually was able to get of him. Okay, so you patent, right? When you discover some new thing, you get a patent on it. I assume in Brazil you do this kind of thing too. So this is from his patent application. And basically what it comes down to is he thought he had a way of doing that transplant without needing to do any sutures. You don't have to sew anything in place. Okay, and I'll explain exactly how he thought it would work and everything. Could you appreciate this might be a good thing? The suture is the thing that might be too tight, so you can't see great the first week, the first month, two months. You use no sutures, maybe it's perfect, the same uniform pressure all over the place, okay? And think of all the time you'll spend. The 15 minutes of doing that long suture, you don't have to do that. I assume in Brazil too, it's expensive to be in operating rooms, you gotta pay all these other doctors and the hospital and everything, so you could save a lot of money. Lots of great things could happen from this. Okay, so he patented it, 
Um, and there is the, 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 you have to do a diagram when you do this sort of thing. So let me explain what's happening. Of course, in the diagram, you make everything look huge. And this is all actually very tiny, okay? So this is the patient. This is their eyeball. You're going to make a hole in it, and that's where you're going to put the corneal button. All that's the same as the usual procedure. This is the corneal button. So you can see how huge it is. From top to bottom, that's actually a half a millimeter. 0.5 millimeter. It's really, really tiny, okay? It just looks huge here. And the only difference he made is, in, in the example, I don't know if you have it, like little girls play with paper dolls in the U.S. You, you have these little slots and they have little tabs on them and you put the tabs in the slot and that's all he was doing here. He figured out a way he, or he thought he could do this and he got really, really smart engineers who used to work at like nuclear bombs, but the U.S. is no longer making nuclear bombs, so they needed other jobs, so they got into peaceful type things. So they figured out a way to cut these little tabs on the, cor on the top of your cornea and you just put the button in there and you'd stick the tab into the slot, okay? I mean, the only hard part of this was design, the hard part, hardest part certainly, was thinking of it and then designing the tree find. Because remember, this whole thing is a half a millimeter. These were about, I think, a tenth of the thickness of the cornea. So that's like 0 0.05 of a millimeter. It's really, really thin, and your cornea in the first place is not, not very, you know, big. So, okay. So that's what he was proposing to do. Okay, so what did he do? He started studying it in cats. That's a good thing, you want to do animal studies, okay? Then he began using in humans. He never filed with uh, IRB, CEP, whatever you want to call the thing, okay? And we'll discuss that, you know, for whatever reason he didn't file with the IRB, and let's talk about why, okay? So that's gonna be the issue, okay? And eventually this made the newspapers. USA Today is a very popular newspaper in the US and this got onto you know, one of the front pages and it was discussing how in 1994 he thought he had this device that would make corneal transplant revolutionarily different, much, much better, right? That it would be cheaper, right? It would make him millions of dollars and what happened was he ended up losing his job. He was the head of an ophthalmology department at the University of South Florida and he ended up losing his job due to controversy about this. And, and right, the federal government went after him and said he performed unapproved research on more than 60 people, including children. I mean, all that sounds very, very bad. Okay. So, and this is just some quotes from what, I was not there at the time, but the office I run was the one that went after him and said he did some very bad things, that he proposed a research study. He used it in 60 people. He discussed it at various you know, meetings, important ophthalmology meetings, and that basically the last thing there is saying, this was research. He met the definition of doing research, and in the US rules, I assume like Brazil's rules, there is a definition of what it means to be doing research. If you're doing research and you're using human subjects, you have to go to a CEP and get the thing approved, and of course he didn't do that. Okay, and, and the worst thing probably from the viewpoint of the university was the government said, you now have to send letters to all of his patients and tell them that research was done on them and you did not get their consent. And of course, the moment you do that, the university is worrying about all these lawyers finding out about it and lawsuits. And there actually were some lawsuits uh, brought about this, okay? So that, very bad thing. Okay, so now let me talk about, I want to give you a way of putting this all together and thinking about it, okay? But, okay, so, okay. Um, so the key point here, okay, again, I don't give you too many points, but there's one key point. So in terms of thinking about these issues, I would encourage you to think about three categories of interactions between doctors or researchers and patients. And one category we've talked about which is standard care, okay? Remember I explained how we do corneal transplants, that standard care. Standard care is the way most people get their medical treatment throughout the world, okay? Again, it's not like there's one type of standard care, but there are ways of figuring out whether somebody's doing standard care or not. There's another category that I'm gonna tell you about what it means, which is non-standard care. And the way I want you to think about non-standard care is, it's still on the clinical side. It's a doctor treating a patient, but instead of using standard care, the doctor may use something new, something not totally proven. And what we're, we're gonna talk about a little about is when is it okay to do that? 
what are the rules that allow a doctor to deviate from standard care and do non-standard care. And then I have the third category there, which I'm sure a lot of you are more familiar with, being in a research study. And what I'm going to claim is that by putting in that middle category of non-standard care, it will help us understand why we have rules that differentiate being in the research, being in that third category, from being in the first category of standard care. And that looking at the three categories instead of just you know, clinical care versus research helps us actually understand why do we have IRBs, why do we have CEPs, and even more importantly, understand how to write good consent forms that are meaningful, that do the right thing vis-a-vis -vis research subjects. So now I'm going to try to explain all that. So the reason I actually use this example is because when Dr. Rousey when all these bad things happened to them, he had an interesting argument about why he never went to the CEP or IRB. And his argument was that he wasn't doing research. And, and we'll discuss whether it was a good argument or not, but for part of my discussion, I'm going to assume, let's assume he was correct, okay? So he said he wasn't doing research, and he had a technical reason. He said it was never part of any systematic investigation. He was basically saying, look, I was in that middle category, okay? I was using some innovative new technique on my patients. And there is a definition in the US, hopefully the Brazil rules aren't all that different, saying you're only doing research if you're doing some sort of systematic investigation and designed to generate information. And he kind of said, I actually wasn't doing anything systematic. I was just going to each patient. Question? that would uh, approach this to our reality here. Uh, the problem is uh, Dr. Dr. Ramsey was a uh, device, was FDA approval, has FDA approval, because he was independent of being a researcher or not. I think yeah. this is the problem number two. The first problem, he was using a medical device. Right. Don't you have to have an approval for medical device f from FDA, right. for instance. Okay, so you raise right. independent of standard or non-standard care. It's approved or not approved for human use. Right. Okay, so you raise a very good issue about there's a device. Do you need approval in the U.S. and the FDA or Brazil, the equivalent of the FDA? Okay, I don't know all the rules here. My understanding is FDA, I'm not aware, has had any problems with what he did. And there are lots of devices in the U.S. that if they're what we would consider non-significant risk devices, you could basically, or even if they're significant risk in some cases, you are similar, you're sufficiently similar to some earlier device. This was not a big fancy uh, piece of electrical equipment with complicated wiring or anything. All it was was a little cookie cutter that was shaped a little different from the corneal cutter, the tree find that's otherwise used. I wouldn't be surprised that all he had to do was file some papers with the FDA and that in terms of tree finds, in terms of these little cookie cutter things, look, it's it uses the same type of pieces of metal that other ones do. It's just a slightly different shape, and that basically FDA would say, somebody would read that and just stamp it and say, it's similar to earlier devices. So you raise a perfectly good argument that that might have been an issue. I don't think that was an issue here. I doubt he was viewed as, and I'm not aware of FDA taking any action against him, but it's a great point, and that certainly could have been an issue. But, and we could duplicate this just to, to think of another example, let's assume he didn't need a tree fine, but all he was coming up with was a different way to sew in the, the thing, okay? Then you wouldn't use any device at all, and for many surgical studies, you don't need anybody's approval. Those are just the rules. A lot of people complain about that throughout the world, that surgeons have a great deal more flexibility than clinicians or, you know, people who give drugs or something. But, so there are a variety of ways where you could actually be going through the regulatory process and, and in terms of FDA and that sort of thing, you haven't actually violated anything. But it's a great point. I don't think it was a problem here. So anyhow, he was saying he wasn't doing research. And I want to explore that, okay? So my, the interesting question I want you to think about is, why was everybody so interested? They were all trying to say, including the regulatory office, OHRP, that he was doing research. And 
they seemed to be concerned if his argument was right, if he really wasn't doing research. Remember, if he was in that middle category, I want you to think about that wasn't on the research side, he was just treating his patients, but he was deviating from standard care, using something non-standard, something you could figure out what adjective you want, experimental, something like that, that maybe he wasn't actually doing anything wrong, okay? So basically, what if he'd been more careful to make sure he really wasn't on the research side of things? And there are things he could have done. He could have not gone to meetings and presented abstracts and things like that. Okay? He could have made sure that, again, he was not kind of anywhere suggesting he was doing research. And let's assume he did enough of that that, you know, and that when he spoke to the patients, he made it clear to them, look, this isn't research. I'm doing this as part of clinical care, but I want you to know it's a new technique. Nobody else is using it. It hasn't been proven yet, but I recommend it. And they made a decision. They said, okay, we know you're the chair of ophthalmology at University of South Florida. You have a great reputation in terms of corneal work, which he did, and we're going to let you do this to us, okay? So let's assume it was, he wasn't on the side of research. So the question is, if he was in that middle category, and again, let's assume he changed what he did, so he's in that middle category, and I think he could have done that, and he was just giving non-standard care, would it have been okay for him to do what he did? And let's think about the rules for doing that. And so perhaps the only problem he made was being too careless, doing too many things that put him on the research side, and had he not done that, had he not been on the research side, he could have done this as non-standard care, and we wouldn't have had a problem. Or at least that's the question I'm asking you. And let's think about the answer to that. And to explore that, far too many words on this uh, slide, but let me explain it to you. This is a New England Journal article, what, from about 15 years ago, and it's by a guy, Bob Trug. Bob Trug is a fairly famous, you know, he's an uh, what, anesthesiologist, a critical care person at Harvard Medical School, very well known in the ethics field, and he was raising in this complicated thing, and don't worry about reading all the words, an argument that had been made many, many times. And the bottom line is that if you just wanted to do something that was non-standard care as a doctor, you could do that to all your patients, okay? On the other hand, the moment you try to do something that most of us would think is more ethical, namely, instead of just doing something to people, try to answer a question and do it in a way that we decide and determine if it really works or not. So you do a randomized trial, okay? The moment you do that, you can't just do it on your patients. You have to get all these approvals. You've got to write formal consent forms. You've got to go through a CEP. You know, this sounds sort of strange. Doing the right thing is actually more burdensome than doing the wrong thing of namely just, you know, trying to treat these people and not answering the question, being in that middle category of providing non-standard care. So that's sort of what this says, and I think he sums it up. This is more from him, okay? Physicians can do almost anything they want in the name of therapeutic innovation. Again, what I was calling giving non-standard care outside of a research study. But only if there's no attempt to gain systematic knowledge. Or I need permission to give a drug to half my patients as part of a research study, but not to give it at all of them, okay? I don't know if some of you think this is a pretty good argument, because a lot of people do think it's a great argument. Again, this was an article in the New England Journal, and he actually wasn't, he's very good at writing it up, but this wasn't brand new. I don't know in Brazil, I suspect there are a lot of researchers here who would say, right on, this is exactly the problem with the system. We have all these insane, really demanding rules that we impose on researchers, but if you just want to do new clinical stuff, you could do it and you don't have to worry about it. So it is a very, very common argument. Um, and so I'm asking you, okay, is this true? Is it the case? Was true right? Were all the other people say this correct? Saying that anything you want to do in terms of therapeutic innovation, go ahead and do it, physicians. You're good to go. But on the other hand, if you're trying to gain systematic knowledge, we suddenly, you know, stop you from doing that and you have to go through all these regulatory things. And the main bottom line in terms of what I'm going to sort of explain is I think he's wrong. 
and I want you to understand why he's wrong, and you may disagree with me, but if you understand why I think he's wrong, I think it will help you understand one of those key takes on why we have different rules for research and why we have different rules for clinical care. So, and in particular, we have to understand the rules for non-standard care. So, let's look at the rules. If you do standard care, the bottom line, and this goes through the, the first course you're going to get in medical ethics, if you're a nurse or a physician or whatever it is, the patient is number one. Going back to what Christine Grady talked about, you know, Hippocrates and kind of, the, well, actually, John Gallen talked about that. You know, clearly things that are not controversial at all. When you're taking care of somebody, they're number one. That's what you have to do when you're providing clinical care. And the point I want to make here is, well, what about this non-standard care category, which normally people don't think a lot about? But the rule that would apply, because this is part of clinical care, is it's still the patient is number one. That is the rule that would have to apply. If you're going to your patient and saying, well, instead of standard care, I think this innovative technique, this new way of sewing in a cornea is the best way to do it, you're still under the rule that the patient is number one. Whatever you do better be for the best interests of the patient. And I'm not telling you yet what research is, okay? Well, why do these rules matter? What happens if the doctor or the nurse, whatever, violates the patient is number one rule? It's malpractice. Okay, and that's generally uh, doctors, nurses, nobody likes that, okay? You don't even want to get sued. Uh, and let's talk about consent. Does the fact that the patient gave the doctor consent change anything? And in general, no. Okay, because you might think, let's assume Dr. Rousey went to these patients and did a great job at telling them, you know, no other doctor in the whole country does this. All these horrible things can happen from this. And the patient says, whatever. I know you're like God, Dr. Rousey. I know this is going to be the best procedure ever. I'm good to go. That isn't good enough. And, and I just want to give this one example. Um, this is a very extreme example, but I think it, it explains it very well because it's true. There was a woman, Barbara Rojas. Um, I believe she was what? Yeah, she was from Ecuador. Okay, so we have a... South American take on this. Uh, she was living in the U.S. Um, she was very poor. She was very obese, and she was very good at losing weight. She lost a massive amount of weight, and you've probably seen some of these pictures. When somebody loses a huge amount of weight, they go from like 350 pounds to like 100 pounds, you have the, these hanging tags of skin. I mean, it's quite horrible. And Again, she was very poor um, in the community of Ecuadorians in the U.S. that she lived in. Their doctors were expensive, and they knew of some doctors from Ecuador who were illegally practicing in the U.S. So the doctor she went to was trained as a physician in Ecuador, but he did not have a license in the U.S., and therefore he couldn't actually go into a hospital. Um, and, but he told her, she found him, and he told her, I could do surgery to remove all this excess skin, but I can't do it in a hospital. We'll have to do it in your bedroom. And so he did this massive surgery in her bedroom. Um, as you could probably guess, sometimes horrible things happen. And a few days later, it was unfortunate, her teenage daughter was there at the time. She started hemorrhaging, and she basically bled to death. They were trying to call the ambulance and everything, but they didn't get there in time. She died. And he actually ended up uh, going to jail. Um, that's very rare that doctors go to jail, but of course when you do something extreme like that, that can happen. Just imagine he did a really good job in terms of informed consent, okay? That he told her, look, this is very, very risky, okay? I certainly wouldn't encourage anybody to do this surgery in your bedroom. So many bad things could happen. Uh, infection, hemorrhage, whatever it is it wouldn't have mattered, okay? This was a very bad thing to do, and in all our countries, I assume, right, sort of like what we're talking about in terms of the FDA, the system protects patients in certain ways such that no matter how much consent they give, there are certain things you cannot do to them, okay? So, so consent doesn't cleanse everything, okay? And again, Dr. Rousey ended up being sued by uh, at least two patients claiming that he did malpractice, and I don't actually know what happened with the end of that. But the bottom line is, 
Can doctors sometimes give non-standard care? Absolutely, and I'm, my guess is it's probably true in Brazil. Doctors actually give a lot of non-standard care. If you're a physician out there, I'm sure you could think of all the times that you sort of changed what you did for the patient that's a little different than standard care. Because the bottom line is, you know, every patient is different. And often to, to, to do the best thing for a particular patient, you may have to deviate from standard care. But when you deviate from standard care, you have to do it in a reasonable way, okay? So the bottom line is, why am I explaining all this? Because these are the rules designed to make sure you're still making the patient number one. If you deviate from standard care, if you give non-standard care, it's because you are claiming for that patient it's actually better for them to not use your usual standard care. And sometimes you'll be right and it's not gonna be a problem. Sometimes you may be wrong that your judgment was wrong, in which case you've committed malpractice. But understand, under all these scenarios, you're still under the rule the patient is number one. That's how we're determining whether or not you commit a malpractice or not. The deviation from standard care better be justified by the best interests of the patient. So all of it is pretty much, everything I'm telling you, pretty much straightforward in terms of classical rules of, of medical ethics. Okay, right, you're comparing the risks versus the benefits. If the benefits outweigh the risks of the patient, that deviation can be acceptable. So, why do we have special research rules? Because we've now changed the rule about the patient being number one. And I suspect some of you will say this is perfectly straightforward, and then some of you will say something that, again, a lot of people will think is a controversial thing. That when we do research, we're always doing everything to keep the best interests of the patient number one. And probably some people during this you know, series of lectures have probably said that. Um, and that's just not true, okay? What we actually have are rules that are balancing competing interests. We have conflicts of interest in terms of why we do the research versus trying to do what's best for the patient. And these rules are designed to make sure we have the appropriate balance in terms of the two goals. And that's a hard thing to do, because we have two interests going in different directions, and we got to want to get the right balance. But the reason we need that thing in the first place is because we're doing research not to advance the interests of the patient. And I recall actually others have said that in the, in the, in the earlier talks. This is a key thing to keep in your mind. You could say it all you want, that when we do research, the patient is, or the subject is always number one. But that just isn't true. If you look at what research involves, we are doing many things to people not in their best interest, but because we want to serve another goal. We're not going to do horrible things to those subjects, and that's why we have these rules. So basically, this is the justification for why we have IRBs, why we have CEPs, why we have rules around the world to balance this conflict of interest, okay? So this is just summing it up. Research involves a conflict of interest. The researcher is pursuing two goals. Now, not always, okay? There may be studies in which you actually don't have any treatment goal at all, but in many of these studies that involve a person with a medical condition in which you're using some experimental treatment, treatment, on the one hand, you're trying to answer the research question, and sometimes, on the other hand, you're treating the patient, and those goals may be in tension with each other. They may not go in the same direction, and therefore, to make sure we don't take too much advantage of our research subjects, we have rules that have been thought out, and we have bodies that enforce those rules, IRB, CEPs, whatever. And, and this is just spelling out some of these things so you can understand, because none of these things are things that should be a surprise to many of you, okay? Researcher, unlike a clinician, is allowed to do a number of things that might be bad for the patient. And again, if it was on the clinical care side, we wouldn't let the person do that, because the rule is you gotta do everything for the best interest of the patient. But because we acknowledge that doing research is important to all of us, we, we discussed, it was a Christine Gray who said, it's a public good. We all benefit from it, okay? Even if we're not a research subject, we're still gonna benefit from the knowledge that's learned, okay? So these are four of the, probably the most prominent things that are often not in somebody's best interest. Randomization may be the trickiest, but I would just ask you, Often we're not sure which of two treatments, which of two antibiotics is best for a patient. But when generally that happens, when we're unsure, I suspect your doctor will use her best judgment to pick what she thinks is best for you, okay? 
you could ask yourself how often your doctor in clinical care would say, gee, there are two antibiotics. I'm not sure which is better. I'm going to flip a coin today. I don't think any of you has ever had a doctor say that to you. And there's a reason why the doctor didn't do that, because even if there is uncertainty, generally most of us in the face of uncertainty will use whatever limited information we have to make a best judgment. We probably won't say, gee, I'm not sure, let's flip a coin, okay? So you could think about that, but I wouldn't necessarily buy the argument some will say is, you know, randomization is in your best interests, okay? Um, standardization, okay? Again, you guys probably know more than most people, protocols are often standardized. Why do we do that? Because we want to get rid of the noise. We want the people on both sides, everything our wonderful statisticians told about, to pretty much be almost identical to each other or to eliminate all the other noise except for the thing that you're randomizing on. And so to make sure things are as standard as possible, we, we basically write a protocol that says, look, normally doctor, you might want to adjust this medicine to make sure all this person since pain went away. Well, in this protocol, don't adjust it so much. We want it in a narrow range, okay? Again, you could figure out many, many ways protocols do this. Um, Non-disclosure of interim results. Well, actually, I discussed that this morning, okay? Normally, as a doctor, if you're sitting there and you know, by the way, you're an RMA in a study, and we know RMA has almost zero chance of being better than RMB, and this person is dying of some fatal cancer, you'd normally immediately tell the person, hey, you don't want to be an RMA anymore, you better switch to RMB. In the research study, we don't do that, because if we did that, we wouldn't get the results we need, and again, the number one goal is to be able to do these research studies. So non-disclosure of interim results, and for probably the most common thing. You often do a lot of extra tests and procedures to collect information that the researchers are going to use, but much of this information will in no way change the actual care to the patient, the subject. So you may do extra CT scans, you may do extra lumbar punctures, lots of things to collect data, not going to affect the care of the subject, but you're doing it to learn stuff. Okay, these are all, I would claim, very accepted things that are done in modern day research all the time and by and large are not in the interests of the subject. I'm not saying every research study is going to be horrible for the subject. Some of them may be a wonderful choice for the subject, but all I'm saying is researchers are certainly allowed to do things to subjects that clinicians are not allowed to do. And again, for legitimate purposes, not saying it's illegitimate. So why do we have research regulations? They help us manage the conflict of interest, okay? And they're good, okay? Because again, we don't want to take too much advantage of our research subjects. So we create rules that are designed to make sure, yes, we will do some things to research subjects that might not be in their best interest, but we'll do it in a way that actually is perfectly ethical. And, and we're gonna impose all these rules, okay? Right, we're not inappropriately doing things to them. And you've heard about Tuskegee, so I don't have to talk about that. The Belmont Report, Christine Grady talked about, these are the underlying principles, which are pretty much, I think, consistent with everything I've sort of explained just through this example. Uh, respect for persons, um, it's about you know respecting somebody's autonomy, letting them make decisions, getting informed consent, beneficence, maximizing benefits, minimizing risks. It's about doing the right thing in terms of risks. And justice is about kind of fair enrollment into the trials, okay? You want to be fair in terms of letting people enroll and not having too many people from a particular group enroll and that sort of thing. So that's what justice is about. So these are three major principles. Um, so the result of implementing these principles are regulations in countries around the world. Um, and pretty much the same rules apply almost everywhere, right? We have research ethics review committees, IRBs, CEPs, whatever. Um, thousands of them in the U.S. and around the world. Um, in the U.S., some of them are private, uh, for profit. I know in Brazil, right, you don't have very much of that, and we could discuss that, okay? Um, oh, and let me just point out, okay, they have to review most studies. Um, the, the highest level of review that most studies that are more than minimal risk get is what we call full review. You'd actually have a committee talk about it. They'd all be in a room talking with each other. That's what's called full review. And pretty much for any study that's more than minimal risk, you're probably going to get full review. There are other rules that allow 
the studies that are minimal risk or less, sometimes you don't need full review. But full review is what you need for the certainly more than minimal risk studies. Okay. And these are just some of the rules about kind of at least in the U.S., you know, how you make up IRBs. They need five people. They have to be from diverse backgrounds. Some of this you'll find similar to what the DSMB rules we talked about, okay? Both bodies trying to do things to protect people. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm going to go through some of this stuff fairly quickly. In the U.S., we have a definition of research. We have a definition of human subjects. You only are under these rules if you're both doing research and using human subjects. So you, you actually have to meet all of these rules to be under them. Uh, and there's a definition of research. Again, you don't have to worry about it. Contributing to generalizable knowledge. A uh, human subject is a living individual. So if you're dead, you're not under these rules. Uh, what a wonderful thing to think about, okay? But it, at least in the U.S., you don't have to go through IRBs if you're doing research on dead people. There might be other rules at the state level, but the U.S. government actually doesn't have much in the way of rules on doing research on dead people. They figure you're dead, let's not worry about you too much. Which isn't, I mean, of course, we want to worry to some extent. Okay. And you can actually use a human subject either interacting with them or the second point is, is an important thing. If you're using private information about somebody, you never met them, you have no clue who they are, but you go to the medical records room and you start collecting information about them and you put their name on the top of all your data sheets, you're using hum human subjects in the U.S., okay? Just using the private information means you're using human subjects because we want to protect confidentiality in terms of that. Um, so what are the rules that IRBs are required to apply? And I'm not going to go through all of them, but two broad categories, informed consent, informed consent, informed consent. Let's make sure the person knows what they're getting into in the study and they actually want to do that. Uh, I think that is the strongest rule you could ever have. There is a second set of rules. Remember what we talked about Barbara Rojas, the notion that even if there was informed consent, there are studies we're not going to let people enroll in. They might be too risky or whatever it is a different set of rules. Those are the two main themes. Get informed consent and have an pr appropriate risk-benefit relationship. Okay, both of those are separate rules. We are not going to, even in a research study, let somebody enroll in any, any study regardless of how risky it is. Basically, it's a paternalistic system. We do protect people against things that the, even they might want to volunteer for. So informed consent, you get it from everybody, or if they can't consent, sometimes you get it from their representative. So for a child, you'll be going to the parents, that sort of thing. Usually you have a signed consent form, so you actually have a written document for each study. It has to be voluntary. Um, sometimes you could waive these requirements. If a, a study is low risk, there are certain circumstances in which you don't actually need informed consent. Um, what should a consent, consent form disclose? A lot of information. You want to describe what the problem is that the subject has, what their medical problem is, they should understand that, what's going to happen to them in the study, uh, the risks from being in the study, the possible benefits from being in the study, alternatives to being in the study. So a good consent form will cover a whole number of topics. Bottom line, you want to give them the information they need to know to make a good decision about being in the study. That is one of the key parts of making the research ethical. You know, you may be doing stuff to them that may not be in their best interest, but if they know it is and they said, well, I, I want to help you out anyhow, that's okay, as long as it's not too risky a study. Um, okay, so now and this, I'll go through this very briefly, but I'm giving you an example of a real issue in terms of a consent form because I want to get back to some of the issues people are debating about right now, and this relates to actually disclosure of alternatives. There was a study that took place, it's over now, it, um, there are some drugs, I suspect a lot of you are familiar with them, that actually reduce the risk of a woman getting breast cancer if she has a high risk to begin with. Um, tamoxifen is the most famous of those. It was discovered and proven to do this a long time ago. And after tamoxifen, there was a second drug of the same class discovered, but we weren't sure yet whether it had the same effect, whether it was equally good. And so it was proposed to do a randomized study. This is a big study, 22,000 women, five years, and basically you would get either tamoxifen or raloxifen and see your likelihood of getting breast cancer. Uh, again, the tamoxifen was already proven and FDA approved for 
reducing the risk of breast cancer. Raloxifen was actually already on the market. It was on the market for osteoporosis, right, to protect the, the calcium in your bones for women. Um, it wasn't on the market for prevent or for reducing your risk of breast cancer. But in the U.S., and I know in some, lots of other countries, you could often use a drug on an off-label basis. Once it's on the market, it is okay for doctors under certain circumstances to prescribe it for one of these unproven things. So here's what the consent form said. Under alternatives, instead of being in a trial, you could ask your doctor to prescribe tamoxifen or to surgically remove both breasts which again was already proven. And, and there were uh, women out there who genuinely wanted that done, okay? So those are the two options it told you about. It didn't point out that maybe you wanna ask a doctor to just give you raloxifen, okay? And it, it in fact was a fact that, because there was a study done about this, a third of the doctors who met these women and treated these women were already using it for that purpose, okay? So it was actually very, very common. But the consent form did not mention to these women, you know, instead of thinking about this being in the study, well, maybe you want to have a doctor surgically remove both breasts, and maybe you want tamoxifen, but what about raloxifen? And, and I don't know if I pointed out on the other slide, well, there were good reasons for some women to prefer raloxifen. Tamoxifen actually was known to increase another type of cancer. And so you might think, well, gee, you want me to take this drug to reduce my risk of breast cancer, but increase my risk of, I don't remember, it was uterine cancer or whatever. Uh, and the thinking was that raloxifen maybe doesn't have that problem. So for some women, and you might think, of what if a woman actually had thin bones? So she could both get the raloxifen to make her bones stronger, and as a side effect, maybe reduce the risk of breast cancer. Okay, so this was not disclosed in the consent form, and this was what you would hear from um, the lead researcher who's running the study. Oh, it would be too early outside of a research study for a doctor to actually be giving raloxifene. We don't yet know its long-term benefits or risks. And, and I think that's a fascinating argument. Um, so let's think about it from the viewpoint of a woman who is enrolling in the study. Um, what are the risks to her, okay? Um, if she got this stuff outside of the study, let's assume she went to a doctor to get raloxifene, probably the risks would be identical to the risks of getting it inside the study. There's nothing magical the researchers would be able to do to alter the risks of being on raloxifene. Millions of women were on raloxifene, okay? So we knew the risks. Um, and from getting it outside of the study, for many women, and again, you could think about your own thinking about these sorts of trials. Often, people with bad diseases enroll in research, randomized studies in particular, not because they want the standard care arm, because they're keeping their fingers crossed that they'll get the new arm, particularly when it's an arm you can't get outside of the trial. So here you have a woman who may be thinking, yeah, I you know, really want to reduce the risk of breast cancer. Um, in the trial, Half the time, she's going to get randomized to tamoxifen, which there was already a concern that a lot of women weren't going near tamoxifen because it was going to cause another type of cancer to increase in risk. So this woman is sitting there. Why, if she's going to have the same risks in terms of raloxifen and actually would prefer she was randomized to raloxifen, instead of a 50% chance of being randomized to raloxifen in the trial, she could go to one of these doctors. And we already know a third of the doctors out there would be happy to give it to her and be sure of getting raloxifen instead of going in the trial and hoping she, the 50%, you know, works out that she gets randomized to raloxifen she wants. So the question, bottom line, is why isn't it reasonable to disclose to the subjects what this option is? And the broader issue, because this is part of a broader debate, are we doing the right thing in consent forms in general in terms of giving people key pieces of information? One of which often is, what are your options outside of the study? And one of those options often, again, if this is an off-label use, is to get this type of treatment directly from a doctor outside of the study instead of a 50-50 chance on, of it, if that's what you want, think about not enrolling in the study, but you could check, and I don't know how true it is in Brazil. I know Brazil, you're very strict about consent forms. How often is it that the alternative section of the consent form would very clearly let this person know, hey, you have another option. If you want this innovative stuff, you could just get it from a doctor. And I think that's 
Okay. Oh, the other rules that apply to what IRBs do, remember I talked about informed consent, then substantive rules. The risks to subjects have to be minimized, okay? And then you need the proper relationship between risks and benefits. And in particular, what that rule works out to is the sum of benefits to the subjects plus benefits to everybody, to society, should outweigh the risks to the subjects, okay? A complicated formula, because on the benefit side, you, you're looking at both benefits to the subject and benefits to society. On the risk side, you're looking at risks to the subject. The bottom line is that, as we all hopefully know, you can do a study where the risks to the subjects outweigh the benefits to the subject. That happens all the time. By and large, there's not a huge outweighing, and I suspect few CEPs or IRBs would approve that sort of study. Um, but something to think about. And remember, you need equitable selection of subjects. You want to be fair about who you enroll. Um, if subjects are vulnerable to coercion or undue influence, quick take on these things. Coercion is where you're kind of threatening somebody, okay? So basically, I want you to enroll in the study. If you don't enroll in the study, you know, I know where your family lives. Maybe some bad thing is going to happen to them one day. I really would love you to enroll in the study, okay? You could appreciate that's a very, very bad thing to do, but that's what coercion is. Undue influence is very different. Undue influence is often promising a benefit to somebody, but the question is it's such a wonderful benefit that that person won't even seriously think about the risks that they're exposing themselves to. So often it is financial. Imagine giving somebody a really, really large amount of money and they're relatively poor. And even though they really don't want to be in this study, they suddenly decide, gee, with all this money I could help out my family, I could send my kids to university. What a good thing, okay? That's the sort of thing. It's still an unclear concept, but that's the heart of it. You're promising them such a great benefit that they're not going to really seriously think about the risk side of things. So those are things I worry about, about vulnerable people, often poor people, people with bad education. Uh, okay, so this is, let's go back to Dr. Rousey's study. What if he actually really was on the IRB side of things. He was doing research. Remember, I was suggesting maybe he could have changed it so he wasn't doing research. What if he was doing research? Would it have gotten through an IRB? Okay, and um, I don't know, okay? I mean, you'd, again, it might have gotten through. Remember, on the research side of things, you don't have to necessarily have the benefits of subjects outweighing the risks of subjects. You gotta look at the balance. And it could be possible that an IRB would have found it a reasonable balance of risks and benefits. What you might actually want to have done is start out doing it on people who had a blind eye to see how it worked or something. And then after seeing it work there, then you could go to people with, with you know, certain types of visual problems. So it's an interesting thing, but if you did good informed consent and everything, it's possible that study could have happened. Um, again, because we have different rules for research that allow things to happen to people that aren't in their best interests. Um, oh, and I just have, a, so finish up on this. Not too bad time-wise. Um, so Ebola is a good example of some of these issues. If you've been following this stuff in the press, there have been very active discussions of exactly some of the lines I've been drawing here about, for example, you've heard probably about this drug that there was a little bit of only for a few people, and it ended up, some of it, going to two U.S. people who then were brought back to Emory University in the U.S. And at this point, my understanding is it wasn't done as part of a research study. It was basically done as part of non-standard care. They had a horrible disease. Ebola has a huge mortality rate. And if you were sitting there with Ebola and you heard, well, there's a company in San Diego that has a drug that hasn't been tested on any human beings, uh, do you want to try it? And again, this would be as non-standard care. I suspect a lot of people could reasonably say, Look, I don't care if it hasn't been tested on many people now. At the moment, the doctors are telling me I'm very sick. Ebola has a 50% mortality rate. Um, I'm willing to do that, okay? That this would be very reasonable. Again, not research. We're just talking about the non-standard care side of things in terms of the best interests of those patients. It could very well be a reasonable decision for them to say, even though this drug hasn't been tested much, we don't know that much about its safety even. We certainly don't know a lot about its efficacy. It still could be reasonable for these people to actually 
tried a drug. Now what the, it also describes here is there was a, a doctor in Sierra Leone who wasn't even given the choice of this because all these people taking care of him said, we don't even want to bother him with this, it's too risky, and so they never even offered him an option, and he never knew, and he died. Now, again, it could have been the thing would have been totally useless and nothing would have helped him at all. Um, so the question, again, sort of the analysis we went through, if offered is not non-standard care, would it have been reasonably in the person's best interest? And that could be true, even for a drug that has not yet been proven safe or effective if you're under very unusual circumstances. Similar to circumstances, we have people dying of incurable cancers. Those patients can legitimately consent to very risky things, and I suspect most of us would agree that could be a reasonable choice. Um, oh, and here's a quote from a, an expert in tropical medicine from Tulane, a university in the U.S. If I were sick with life-threatening disease, I'd want a drug even if no safety testing, which again, I think is a very reasonable comment. Um, now, if the drug were offered in research, notice under these rules it would be even easier to allow that to take place because if it's in research you're recognizing we're doing it for two purposes the additional purpose of learning about the drug so we'll know whether other people should get it so in terms of which is an easier thing to approve ethically doing it in research is easier it makes it actually a lot easier for us to not worry so much about that gee, it hasn't been tested, it, 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 we don't know whether it's safe, we don't know whether it's efficacious, because we're looking at the benefits of the public. Again, we certainly wouldn't want this to be totally off the wall, and this is a legitimate question. So if you want to read more now, you will see there are lots of debates in the newspaper about what's going on in Africa right now about this is, these issues, and certainly in the U.S., about, gee, should we now be sort of you know, doing randomized trials on these drugs, and I think I have a final different scenario. What about vaccines? The vaccine is even trickier now, because now we're talking about giving something to people who don't yet have the disease. At least the person who has the disease is in a worse scenario, so they're willing to accept more risks. But what I've been told is some of these vaccines actually have legitimate major downsides, that if you, you recently contracted disease, but you don't, yet know you have it, the way your, your you know, immune system works, it may actually make things worse for you. Uh, and I think that's the end of it. Yeah. So I don't know if, if Laura Lee wants questions for a couple minutes. Okay. But you could use up the time on other things. Okay. So we are being allowed if, if anybody has any questions about it. And if you don't, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, suppose that I have already uh, an approved protocol uh, by my CAEP mm -hmm. and I follow up a court of patients for two or three years and I measure some outcomes and then I decide to evaluate another thing just like a biomarker and for which I need only one, sa one blood sample of each patient. Do I need to submit a new protocol to my CEP or I can use the same approval from two or three years? Ago? Okay, yeah, okay, so complicated question and I'm certainly not gonna know the Brazil answer to because there may be a unique answer. So you did an original study. Did you already collect the blood during that study or do you, you don't need any more blood from any of your subjects? Or do you need to? You have all the blood you need. So the question is, your original study did not say that you were going to do this extra test. You have a new research question, right? And so the question is, can you go ahead and test blood that you already have from the initial protocol? Um, that's a somewhat complicated issue that is at least somewhat being debated in the U.S. and I have no idea, maybe others could speak, in terms of what's going on in Brazil. Uh, one answer to that gets into the issue of under the US rules, if you're not actually having private identifiable information, maybe you're not even using human subject. So what you might talk about is, can you somehow strip identifiers from the blood samples and use them as an anonymous sample? Um, that's a little tricky, so this gets back to the underlying ethical question is what did the subjects think they were consenting to and to what extent 
are you doing things that they might have disagreed with had you gone back and consented to them? On the flip side of that is, as you describe it, and I assume this is correct, you're not really doing a lot of harm to them in terms of doing this because you already have the blood sample. Presumably the only risk to them is some privacy risk in terms of if somebody learns information about their medical condition or a um, trickier thing, what, if, what about what will happen if you learn something important about their medical condition? Are you just going to sit on that information or are you going to have to tell them? Um, Again, in the U.S., these are sorts of issues that we're having somewhat of a debate about. In fact, three years ago, we proposed a major revision to all of the human subject rules, many different aspects of them. Uh, it's still being evaluated in the U.S., and we had many, over a thousand comments on it. One of the issues was, whenever you do research with a biospecimen, should you always need to get that person's consent? Because in the U.S., Let's assume it was just extra blood. The blood you're talking about was originally not from a research study, but it was from a pathology lab, and they just had extra blood on a whole bunch of patients, and these patients had the medical condition you wanted to study. Under the current U.S. rules, you could take a bit of that blood from the pathologist as long as you don't get the patient's name. You're not using a human subject, because remember, you're not interacting with the patients. You're not having private identifiers. So under the current system, there's no human subject. You don't need consent, and that's a way to actually do a a lot of biospecimen research. Um, again, the question's a little different if you're talking about a biospecimen you got in a research study, but the question on the table now in the U.S. is should we make the rules more strict about getting consent on biospecimens? And that was one of the things that was asked. A lot of the people who commented on that were actually critical of that. They were saying this is relatively low-risk research and if we don't do this kind of research, we're going to have to do more clinical trials, and that's riskier research. And, I mean, there's some merit to those arguments. So bottom line, it is unresolved. Uh, it's a great issue. And I don't know if there was, were others going to comment on that in terms of Brazil rules or no? I don't know. You uh, um, it's just a kind of curiosity. I have a question, Jerry. It's just a kind of curiosity. Okay, How do sure. you deal with a private R&B in your country? I mean, uh, how do you deal with this uh, conflict of interests in a private... Uh, oh, private CEP? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, right, because you don't have private Not CEPs in Brazil. Okay, so the the summary of that, I would say, is Different types of IRBs have different types of conflicts. Some people will say, you, you look at the CEPs that are part of a university. Um, they have some degree of conflict, because they're generally, you have re researchers who are on the CEP reviewing studies of their colleagues. And again, it's their university. They want it to, to do well. I assume in Fiocruz, Fiocruz has CEPs, or they're part of the system, yes? Is that... So again, there is some degree of conflict that those CEPs want to help their institution do well. If they are too strict in terms of turning down too many studies, it's probably in the back of their mind that isn't good for their institution. And they want to be part of an institution that's doing important cutting edge research. So there's a conflict there. On the other side, for the private CEP, there is a different type of conflict, okay? Um, they're being paid by some group, by a university or whatever it is, to review the research. And clearly, again, if they're too strict, if they're turning down important studies, they're thinking, well, gee, the people that pay us are going to stop paying us. They're going to go to my competitor. So there's a conflict there. Um, both of them are different types of conflicts. And everything I've heard is that there actually isn't a lot of good data, empirical research, in terms of which of them is, is doing a worse job. Um, I mean, what I could tell you, at least in the U.S., is there are very, very large private CEPs, IRBs, and 
in terms of formally following all the rules, they actually probably do a very good job because they have huge numbers of, of members and they know the rules very well and they have lots of lawyers that are looking at this sort of stuff. Um, the trickier issue for all of them is getting back to, and, and just my personal views, some of the issues I was talking about. If you're going to do a good job in terms of informed consent, it turns often on some of these things that are really going to affect whether a, a person decides to participate in a study. How clear are you in terms of telling them about their alternatives, their options outside of the trial. And I don't know that, you know, there are problems with IRBs both on the private side and on the university side. Uh, I mean, to give the biggest criticism, and I suspect you've heard it in Brazil as elsewhere, a fair number of people will say the current system isn't actually accomplishing that much. We spend a lot of time and effort in slowing down studies and going through CEPs, and it's unclear even if we didn't do that whether the system would be all that different. And, and again, the bottom line is we just don't have a lot of good data about how the current system is, is functioning. So you're asking a great question that I don't think anybody out there has a clear answer to. But I, I wouldn't immediately conclude the private CEPs are so much worse than the university-based CEPs. Um, I do interact with them, and, and we see a lot of them on the US side, and they're not Again, a lot of them are at least very professional looking in terms of their understanding of the rules. And again, a lot of people wouldn't be going to them unless they thought they were very professional. So it's not as if in the US it's the low, what we call the lowest common denominator, that lots of people are looking for the CEPs who are cheapest and who they think will not even look at the study very hard and just ordinary, quickly approve it. I don't think that happens a lot. So do we have any more questions or? Yeah. I'm going to talk in Portuguese, in Portuguese. please. <laughs> uh, now, it's para complementar a, a pergunta que foi feita. É, em relação à pergunta que foi feita anteriormente sobre o biomarcador. Então, a resposta é a seguinte, pelo menos para o sistema CEPI-CONEP. É, se o biomarcador, ou qualquer coisa que a gente quer adicionar posteriormente, implica em um novo objetivo, ou implica em mudar em alguma linha o termo de consentimento, ou implica em algum, preencher uma área temática que antes não tinha sido preenchida, talvez seja necessário é fazer uma emenda. E essa emenda entra dentro da avaliação do CEP e se essa área temática é especial, como, por exemplo, o biomarcador é, algum, é algo genético que vai determinar se essa pessoa é suscetível ou não a alguma é, doença, por exemplo ou se esse biomarcador só pode ser analisado no exterior e então implica em envio de amostra de material biológico para o exterior. Então, talvez, ou seja necessário fazer a aumenta e enviar para a CEP ou CONEP, dependendo de qual seja o biomarcador, ou talvez seja necessário fazer um projeto ancilar, tá? É, justificando que é exatamente na mesma população que foi recrutada, ou se, por exemplo, você precisa aumentar o tamanho da população a ser recrutada, então também é, pode ser aplicável a extensão do protocolo de pesquisa. Sim, obrigado por essa informação. E, de novo, no bottom line, acho que isso não é tão dissimilar ao sistema US. I think the bottom line currently is that there are ways to do what you were trying to do without perhaps needing informed consent, right? You might amend the protocol, the IRB might be able to waive consent, whether or not you could strip identifiers, unclear, but there are often ways right now to do that sort of thing one way or another without necessarily always having to go back to get informed consent. Again, whether or not that is the right system is within debate currently. Do we want to get stricter in terms of the use of biospecimens, stricter in terms of more frequently requiring informed consent is sort of an issue on the table. And you will hear people going in both directions. But thanks so much for, for the analysis on your side. Uh, are we done? Okay. 
Boa tarde. É, a minha dúvida é em relação à questão ética em pesquisa com crianças. Em que momento da pesquisa ela pode entrar nas fases, fase 2, fase 3? E como é que ocorre essa questão do consentimento informado? Pega só dos responsáveis? As crianças e adolescentes também respondem por esse consentimento? Que aqui a gente tem a questão do termo de assentimento. Se isso também acontece lá. Ok. Um, so, how do we do research with children? Um, and you're absolutely right. It sounds like it's very similar to the Brazilian concept. For children, um, you basically need the permission of the parents and the assent of the children, assuming the child is old enough that they could have some understanding of what might happen to them in the research study. That is the general rule, and of course all of this will depend on the age of the child. Um, there are some modifications to that, so for example, if the study is offering something to the child that let's assume they have a bad medical problem and there's only an option of some experimental treatment as part of the study, there are ways of not needing the assent of the child. So even if the child is saying no, it could be that the permission of the parents will be enough. Again, the notion is that sort of study might be one that is in the child's best interest and you don't want a child that doesn't fully understand what's going on to prevent themselves from getting an appropriate treatment. So, um, and probably this is built into what you were talking about before, we also have risk categories in the U.S. I would guess your system has it too. So, for example, only certain types of studies can enroll children. It could be minimal risk. It could be a study where the possible benefits to the child outweigh the harms. And then there are two other categories that are a little more complicated. So the bottom line is, Again, similar to some of the themes I talked about, even with consent, even with both the child's assent and the permission of the parents, because we know the child doesn't always understand what's going on, we don't allow riskier studies for, for children to be enrolled in riskier studies. You have to fit into these risk categories. And by and large, they're actually fairly protective of children. Some would say they're too protective because the result is that for a long time, we basically don't know which drugs work in children. So instead, we're basically doing experiments. Every time we give a child a particular dose, we don't know if it's the right dose. Wouldn't it be better if we did a, some research on small numbers of children, and then we had knowledge that benefited everybody? But at the moment, the system is still fairly paternalistic. Thank you.